Some of us have overflowing in foreign had, I'm talking now of 1997. Some of us have overflowing foreign exchange reserves. And we could have helped you who went into crisis, South Korea and so on, by using our foreign exchange reserves with a, some sort of swap agreement. Instead, you let the IMF come in and dictate terms. So why don't we get together and establish our own regional um, arrangement? It began as the idea of the Asian Monetary Fund that was vetoed again by Larry Summers, but also by China, as a matter of fact. Um, but then it had sort of emerged in the form of a much looser idea for bilateral swaps in the event that a country went into crisis. But swaps within the region from countries with overflowing foreign exchange reserves to those with too little. Um, and the whole point of it, this is what I emphasize, the whole point of it was to provide an alternative to the IMF. The paradox is that from the beginning, it built in what was called the IMF link. And the IMF link said that for a country in crisis to borrow more than a very small percentage, like 10% of what the rules allowed it to borrow, it would have to apply to the IMF for help. It would have to be under an IMF program. That's very paradoxical, since it undercut the whole point of the thing. And so this is the reason why, clearly, even with something like the Chiang Mai Initiative, um, the Chiang Mai Initiative lending by one country with abundant foreign exchange to a country with, uh, in crisis, the lending had to come with conditions. It had to come with tough conditions. Because if a country knew, like if South Korea knew, that there was this arrangement um, on tap whereby it could get emergency lending very cheaply and with no conditions, then obviously there's a moral hazard problem. There's a prob problem that the government of South Korea may say, okay, we're going to grow like crazy, and if it goes wrong, we have this backup with no conditions. So there's an incentive for the government without facing conditions to operate recklessly. That's the sense in which it's a moral hazard. And in particular, the problem that, that then arose was this. The Chiang Mai Initiative would have to impose tough conditions, point number one. Point number two, the distrust between China and Japan was so intense that they both feared that if the Chiang Mai Initiative impose tough conditions on a country in crisis like South Korea or Malaysia or whatever, that the other one would come in under the table with a very soft loan without conditions in order to buy favor from the country in crisis. So, um, uh, that, and that's basically why they said, um, in order to avoid this possibility of either China or Japan coming in to undercut the tough conditions that were necessary in the Chiang Mai Initiative uh, in order to get favor from the government in crisis. In order to avoid that, we must have the IMF involved because the IMF will be able to monitor much better than we can ourselves and make sure that nothing is happening under the table, so to speak. And that's why they built in the IMF link from the beginning. Um, now, and from the beginning, uh, East Asian officials that I've talked to uh, who were involved in this, they just hang their head in shame uh, at the fact that they couldn't institute an arrangement without bringing in the West um, th through this IMF link. They think this is very shameful. Over the years, they've been trying to kind of upgrade this whole Chiang Mai initiative, and they took steps in 2009 uh, 2007-2009 to upgrade it um, and the upgrading was signaled by a change in name it's called now the Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization M stands for multilateralization so the size of the swaps was increased the amount that a country can borrow without first getting the IMF in was increased for, to I think something like 30% um, and also a secretariat was established. This is very interesting. And this shows you the small politics that go on in these kind of things. So the question, first question was, we're going to establish a secretariat. Where should it be established? 
Well, Singapore immediately came in and said, here's the land, here's the building. So that problem immediately solved. Then the question was, who is going to be the president of the Secretariat? And of course, um, China, Japan, and ASEAN all put up candidates. Um, China and Japan vetoed each other's candidate. And so that was good news for ASEAN, because ASEAN hoped that therefore its candidate would get to be the first one. Everybody wanted to be the first one, because the first one sets the whole direction of the thing, sets what it does, what it doesn't do. Well. There was stalemate and very bitter recriminations going on for about nine months between finance ministers involved, but eventually the outcome is the first president is Chinese. Um, China won. And then came a completely intriguing question. The question is, what was the name of the secretariat? Everybody agreed that the acronym of the name was AMRO, but they didn't agree on what the acronym actually stood for. <laughs> And there was, a, there was a substantive issue behind this disagreement. Some people said that the acronym stands for ASEAN plus three, so that's A, ASEAN plus three, macroeconomic, M, research, R, organization. But others said, no, there has to be an AND, A and D, between macroeconomic and research. And the reason why these others, this was, um, uh, some others who were very worried about China in particular, they said we have to have an and there because um, if there is an and between macroeconomic and research, that means that it does two things, not just one. If it's macroeconomic research, it just does macroeconomic research. If it's macroeconomic and research, it means it does macroeconomics and it does research. Well, macroeconomics, that word was code, code word for surveillance, for mutual surveillance. Well, the last thing China wants is for anybody else to do surveillance of China, especially on China's exchange rate policy. That's the last thing. So China said no, no and, it's just uh, ASIN plus three macroeconomic research organization, and in the end, China again won. So the official name of AMRO is ASIN plus three macroeconomic research organization. And no doubt the Chinese president is making sure that AMRO only does kind of research rather than other things. Okay, so um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there except um, to make one point which slightly qualifies what I've been saying. I've been emphasizing that the so-called rise of the South is exaggerated both economically and especially politically. However, it's also true uh, that uh, qualification has to be made on that second point about politics because there is a process happening what people um, have coined a new word for which is G20ization G20ization what that means is that senior positions at the World Bank and the INF are increasingly being taken by nationals of G20 countries such as for example the, um, the former the outgoing uh, chief economist of the World Bank was a Chinese national, Justin Lin. Um, he was the first non-G20, sorry, non-G7 chief economist ever, um, and it went to China. And now the next chief economist, as I said before, is from India. And if you look across the range of the sort of number two positions in these organizations, then they are being taken up more and more by G20 nationals, to the considerable uh, anger, I should say, of the 182 other UN countries who find themselves being just consistently um, excluded, increasingly excluded. So basically, that's uh, the end of my talk. I'd be happy to take questions. I know that there were some questions back there um, as I was going. Do you want to? Uh, thank you. Actually, you said you uh, didn't want to reply to that question before I asked the question. You, you said that uh, my, my question was like, uh, why the U.S. did not choose a better candidate for War, uh, World Bank presidency, uh, given that there were other very good candidates on the table? In the U.S.? Yeah, um, it, it is puzzling, but... Um, mm -hmm. 
you have to understand that at the top level of uh, not just American but other Western uh, politics, at the top level, as distinct from the sort of the big bureaucratically organized level lower down, um, personal relationships are really, really important. It's kind of like the mafia. But the mafia, of course, operates much lower down. Um, but at the top, it's the same kind of idea. You have to know people. And um, Dr. Kim has been very close to the Clintons through the Clinton Foundation, um, uh, close to both Bill and to Hillary. Um, there's a longer story to that that I, I won't go into. Um, but secondly, Dr. Kim has been close to Timothy Geithner. Timothy Geithner is a, an alumnus of Dartmouth College and is on the Board of Governors of Dartmouth College. And Timothy Geithner was on the Board of Governors when Dartmouth selected Dr. Kim to be president of Dartmouth. So um, Geithner knows Kim very well, too. Um, and so those are two important reasons why, why when they thought about who they might nominate, um, they decided to go for this um, sort of apparent um, outsider, that is a person who has no connection with banking or finance or very little experience of managing large organizations and so on and so on, because he was known to them. Um, I'm generalizing from that. Uh, these people depend very heavily on personal connections. And so it's very useful for the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Treasury to have somebody at the World Bank. The World Bank is an intelligence ga gathering organization. It has people all over the world. knows a great deal of what's happening across vast swathes of the world. To have somebody in that position who is your friend, that is, you can ring up uh, at 10 o'clock at night and say, you know, what's going on? What's the latest in, in region X? What's the latest in country Y? That is invaluable. Um, whereas if you just appoint somebody, even if on Wall Street, who kind of has a high reputation as a good manager or something, you don't have that personal connection. So the personal connection wins out over uh, sort of meritocratic qualifications. Good. Yeah. Let's, let's go in this order. One, two, three. Can I ask one more afterwards? Sorry? Can I ask one more at the end? Sure. If there's time. <laughs> if there's time. Do we go around this way? I promise to keep my question short. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to follow up on your question to Stiklis and Ravi last night because this presentation really implies that you have an answer for it. And you was asking Stiklis and Ravi that what's going on in the the economics, the, the, the debates within the economic school heterodox and neoclassical, and you seem really shocked in terms of how the persistency in the mindset of American neoclassical um, and neoliberal economists or the mainstream that given the evidence of the financial crisis and the fellow in macro and you know, various policy level implied by the mainstream that these instruments no longer works. You asked Stiglitz as far as what's going on, and it seems like there's an implication that there are some dynamics that's going on behind the persistency in the mindsets of, of the so we take people two in the school. At a time. Uh, no, I mean that's that's such a big question. Let me let me just say something about it. I think, um, first of all, I'm very puzzled myself. I don't have a good answer, um, but. Um, we have had this austerity drive in Europe now for years as the response. Um, um, Schaubel, Wolf, uh, Wolfgang Schaubel, the German finance minister, said in the Financial Times in September 2011, quote, austerity is the only cure for the Eurozone, unquote. And the United States, um, having initially had quite a big stimulus, relatively speaking, is now moving back towards austerity. So we're having austerity drives on both sides, in Western Europe and um, in, in America. The obvious kind of um, hypothesis is that um, political conservatives uh, who have a strong moral vision 
of a, a moral society or a vision of a moral society um, uh, uh, as one in which you have a small government, um, market forces um, rule, um, people get on according to their ability to compete in the marketplace, um, failures fail, people are allowed to fail, they're not bailed out, um, and that, bit, that, that kind of society builds um, strong, self-reliant individuals. Um, and this is attached, this notion of the moral society is attached to a very clear set of ideas about how to bring up children. So the children also will be um, self-reliant um, adults. <clears throat> and so one obvious hypothesis is that political forces that have long held this notion of a moral society, Hayek, for example, that whole, the Austrian, and indeed the Chicago school thought uh, along these lines, that their, their notion of society um, overarching their notion of the economy, a desirable economy, was this kind of conception of a moral society. This is spelled out very well in a book called Moral Politics by George Lakoff. Lakoff is a sociolinguist at Berkeley moral politics. It's, uh, it's quite a, a, an eye-opening read. However, I don't think that that, uh, I don't think it's enough to say that um, um, political forces who have this notion of the moral society um, have somehow or other got control and are determined to use the opportunity of the crisis to advance their notion of, um, of the moral society. Um, so, I, the, I can't go much further, but I'll just make one other point. I'll remind you of this amazing quote from my friend who told me this just a few months ago, a very senior British academic economist um, who has been consistently wrong. Um, uh, he, uh, and, and also influential, by the way, he's been influential in putting his wrong uh, opinions into uh, practice, and he said um, Keynes was a disaster, Skidelsky should be locked up, Krugman has lost all respect in the economics profession. And he went on to say what I didn't say last night, show me one study that shows a fiscal, that finds a fiscal multiplier of more than one. He said this just a few months ago. And now the IMF, you probably have read, the second big revolution in IMF thinking, the first one I mentioned last night, the second uh, is capital controls. The second one is on the fiscal multiplier. Lo and behold, the IMF has come out and said, and said that when uh, in a recession, uh, when monetary policy has reached the zero bound, if, uh, interest rates can't go negative, in those circumstances, the fiscal multiplier is likely to be three or four, um, so that in a, a 1% um, increase in the fiscal deficit is likely to yield a three or four percent increase in growth rates, so that the increase in the deficit is associated with a reduction in the debt to GDP ratio, not an increase. And yet the whole premise of the austerity drive on both sides of the Atlantic is that that's not right. So the IMF has changed its mind uh, quite recently on this, but my friend, this was before the IMF results came out, said to me, show me a single good study which finds a fiscal multiplier of more than one. Um, so he, he's just sort of locked into this way of um, thinking and I'm just quite bemused as to how somebody can think and then think like this, especially because what we are doing in both in Western Europe and the United States is to ignore the lessons of the 1930s. Um, and, and so in terms of the idea that knowledge is progressive, that uh, you only need to read the last five years because the people, each, each cohort, builds on the good knowledge of the, its predecessors that leaves aside the bad knowledge. That's total nonsense. We have gone back, um, at least in terms of the minds of people whose hands are on the policy tiller, we've gone back to pre-Keynes in economics. We've gone back to the metaphor, for example, that the government is just like a large household. This was the pre-Keynesian metaphor, 
and everybody said yes, yes, yes. <coughs> it, when a household uh, faces hard times, it has to tighten its belt, it has to cut spending. Government is just like a large household. In hard times, the government has to cut spending. It was Keynes and yet people like Wolfgang Schaubel, the German finance minister, are using that explicitly saying government is like the household. It has to use the same rules of accounting. It's totally wrong, and yet um, this is a popular kind of message um, out there. So, I mean, we have failed terribly. The economic profession has failed terribly um, in, uh, in, in this crisis, in the run-up to the crisis and in the crisis. It's failed in the basic function of educating people into fallacies like that the government is just like a large household. Uh, I think we're really running out of time, uh, Robert. Can we just take a couple of questions okay. to get us in, and then you can choose yeah. what you want to respond to. Okay. So we can have, uh, otherwise we won't get you in the question on the table. So make them easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, so it seems wherever uh, uh, interests are involved, uh, there's some kind of uh, competition or stalemate uh, uh, going on uh, in the in the way an organization is formed. Like, for example, uh, uh, you give examples of US and EU inter interfering with the functioning of, say, IMF or World Bank. And something similar is happening even oh, Just sorry, they, they would never say they're interfering. They would yeah. say we're exercising our governance, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so there is some kind of uh, interest. They have interests. Uh, so that's what is motivating them to interfere, uh, which is not done officially. Uh, as in, through their, uh, through subtle, subtler ways. So even uh, when you spoke about uh, Asian plus three, uh, them trying to uh, trying to select what kind of uh, policies should be implemented or or how should the decision making be done. It seems China and Japan, China mostly won. So there is some kind of uh, competition going on uh, at at all levels, be it developing world or or the developing countries. So the suggestions you made about how to select uh, or how to form an organization like G20, which has lost its uh, legitimacy. Uh, so uh, the suggestions are like legitimate constitution foundation or countries should be clubbed together into constituencies and equal participation should be there. So uh, don't you think it's kind of tough to implement such uh, suggestions given that there are interest groups which are working at all levels? be it US or EU for the whole world, or China and Japan for Asia, or even India for South Asia, perhaps. So, uh, yeah, something yeah. going on, like a predator and prey kind of. As, as I explained in this book, cooperation is very difficult, including between villages and including between states. Um, it is very difficult. Um, yeah. I just want to... Um, problematize perhaps the Kim appointment a bit. As I'll out myself as a former peon at the World Bank, so I've never been at the top like most of the other people we've still spoken to here, but only looked up. So um, the way I kind of, and maybe it's also because I'm optimistic, but the way I looked at the, You're the discussion. You're optimistic? I'm optimistic, uh, slightly, about the, about optimistic. Optimistic. Oh, optimistic. <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> optimistic. I'm sorry. I also heard optimistic. Hey? I also heard optimistic. Oh. I thought domestic as distinct from what? <laughs> <laughs> but to me, um, the, the fact that the conversation happened at all is a big change in the institution. Yeah. And, and Ngozi herself is important, right? Because she's not exactly an outsider. Where did she get her P? She was at MIT or Harvard. She's yeah. a neoclassical economist. And shrewd negotiating, right? And the fact that there's any negotiations whatsoever now about spots one and two, and that that's a public conversation, to me, signals a change perhaps in the right direction and something within, from the peon level, you know, <laughs> of countries and both individuals working in institutions like this. 
segments have changed. And so I just want to see what you might say to that, or and perhaps maybe it is just the G20 and it's not so optimistic. But. Right. Anyone else who had? Yeah. Uh, uh, you were talking about uh, the crisis. Yeah, yeah. Very, I'll be very brief. Uh, the, the crisis in the South uh, East Asia and uh, the role of the IMF. Uh, and then um, I was thinking what is happening now in Europe. Uh, basically, the European Central Bank finally uh, uh, agreed on a plan to buy bonds, uh, basically uh, without limits. Uh, but this, this plan, I will not go into details, but this plan also uh, has an important role for the IMF. And this is uh, probably also, this is striking me because I mean, Europe doesn't really need uh, IMF uh, money in order to uh, buy the bonds of distressed countries, right? So uh, this is another, you know, it's like a similarity I see with the, with the southern eastern uh, uh, countries, uh, and in particular all the, all the mechanism you, you, you were, you were uh, uh, explaining us. Okay. I know a little bit more about your views on the importance of the relevance of the G20 as an institution because, I mean, um, directly, yeah, during the crisis and immediately, like, afterwards, um, a lot of people said that the G20 was very effectively in, yeah, in the coordination of managing the crisis, but then now there also seems to be, there come up notions that the um, G20 um, is not really an institution, that a country, and that is not really effectively in an, an institution where a multilateral uh, institution, but the countries are rather um, going, yeah, that unilateralism is coming back. And um, so I was just wondering whether the um, term g 20 isation is really um, appropriate because um, it might also be that it's just a reflection of a number of emerging countries um, as themselves as individuals yeah, gaining importance in institutions like the World Bank or the IMF, instead of the just G20 as an institution. Yeah, of course, just uh, immediately on that point. Your action doesn't mean that the G20 is somehow or other acting coherently within the World Bank and the IMF. It is, in a way, you're right to pick up, it's slightly misleading. All it means is that individuals from G20 countries, as distinct from non-G20 countries, tending to get appointed to these number two uh, positions. But let me just go back and take up your... Uh, Can we have the last question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my question is very brief. I was just wondering, uh, you probably says that. <laughs> <laughs> my is very uh, I was just wondering how the politics of, of global governance uh, within the institutions that you've been talking about, how that's been playing into as a list of the MDGs as opposed to the MDG plus plus or something else. Thanks, thanks. Okay. I just wanted to take up your um, point. There was um, some progress in the sense that for the first time ever in 2012, there were candidates, serious candidates from developing countries there was, they had to go around the world uh, trying to get support. Um, Kim didn't do so much of that, at least uh, what, he, what he said in the Financial Times, for example, was clearly written by the um, US Treasury. But in any case, there was an appearance of some kind of um, process of uh, getting uh, support, allowing uh, uh, the governments to uh, appraise the, the strengths and weaknesses and, this, and that has never been done before. So I agree with you that that constitutes progress towards a, a sort of meritocratic um, direction and opening up direction. But um, I come back to um, the fundamental obstacles to actually opening it up. Um, first of all, there's this agreement between the Europeans and the Americans, and the voting, and this is the point, of this. That's the first point. Second point is that the voting distribution is such that they can guarantee their candidates, provided they cooperate, um, uh, because they have sufficient the Europeans together and the Americans have sufficient votes to ensure that whoever they nominate for their respective organizations, provided they get cooperation from the other, will get a 
appointed. So that then leads to the question, what are the chances of changing the voting distribution? Now, it happens, I've done a very detailed study, maybe surprised, not surprised to know, um, which should be out in world development fairly soon, on the World Bank's voting reforms, uh, which were announced, apparently big voting reforms announced in 2010, shift votes from the developed countries to the developing countries. When you look beneath the headlines, it's just astonishing how misleading the headlines are. Uh, almost no votes were actually uh, transferred. And uh, one important reason is to do with the Articles of Agreement of the World Bank, and I think the same applies to the IMF. And this is, I was completely amazed when I discovered this. The Articles of Agreement say that any one country, member country of the World Bank, can veto the whole of a voting redistribution if that country loses so much as 0.1% uh, uh, um, of its voting share. And so one reason why, uh, is, by the way, that's called preemptive rights. Does that be repeated? Because it's astonishing. Any one country can veto the whole of a voting reform if it, as a result of the reform, loses so much as a sliver of its existing votes. And one reason why this, uh, the, the reforms announced in 2010 was so protracted, they went on for years and months, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, fighting over not a 0.1% of, of, of voting share, but 0.01% to the second decimal point they were fighting over. And you had Putin ringing up Zealot saying, we will veto the whole thing if we, Russia, lose so much as 0.01%. The Saudi Arabia counterpart to Putin rang up Zealot and said more diplomatically the same thing. And so all kinds of adjustments had to be made to the result in order to accommodate these threats of vetoes. And my point is that it is because of this article thing in the Article of Agreement, Articles of Agreement, decided in 1944, it's extremely difficult to change the voting distribution. Unless the voting distribution is changed, then the Americans and the Europeans together have a position where they will be able to ensure that their candidates get to be either the president or the managing director, president of the bank or the manager for the fund provided they cooperate. So it's very difficult to see how this uh, is going to be broken. And uh, my final point is that if Kim gets a second term, and most presidents have got a second term, we won't even be revisiting this issue of the presidency until 2022. 2022, 10 years. So, so um, I'm rather pessimistic. Um, I wrote down the G20, but I'm suddenly, uh, suddenly forgetting what main point you wanted to no, write. It was I, I really don't, sorry, on your point, on the uh, multilateral development goals, I really don't have anything to say. The uh, sorry, the, yeah, exactly, the Millennium Development Goals, I really don't have anything to say on that, I'm sorry. There was something I wanted to say about the G20, but I've forgotten it, and I see the time is uh, uh, already over, so we have the end. Thank you. <laughs>